you're not crazy about dealing with 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 us especially in this format yet you have a lot of outside interests that are, that are served by having a media platform i guess my question is how do you balance the two when you say i'm not crazy about dealing with you guys what does that refer to well you've said you, you don't especially like the press conference format mm -hmm. and yet that seems to be the the obviously the most widely used means of communicating to the media and through the media to the public hmm, that's interesting i think we can move on to the next question naomi do you want to move on to the next question um, no, I'm actually very interested in that, like, point of view. So if you could repeat that, that'd be awesome. I can't really speak for everybody. I can only speak for myself. But ever since I was younger, I've had a lot of media interest on me. And I think it's because of my background as well as, you know, how I play. Hopefully it's okay if I ask a couple of tennis questions. Um, the first one is just uh, uh, how the training has been and how your preparation has been for the for the summer hard court swing. And the second one is just related to your tweet over the weekend uh, related to what's going on in Haiti. Um, and, uh, and yeah, um, just what your reaction is to the news there. Thank you. Um, Sorry. No, you're super good. Okay, I think we're just going to take a quick break. Just uh, we'll be back in one moment. All right, uh, Mike, you just saw and heard Naomi Osaka in her press conference yesterday. You know, a lot of a lot of different trains running. Uh, as the late August Wilson would say, two trains running at least, or two, uh, two or three trains running in that press conference. One, uh, she was asked about Haiti. Uh, she had to pause. Uh, she did come back to continue the press conference. She was also asked about press conferences and her approach to them and how reporters engage with her and um, how she will continue to do press conferences going forward. And, you know, I, look, we've talked a lot about Naomi, Naomi Osaka and mental health. And sometimes we had a very uh, you know, candid conversation, you and I did, Mike, about how, you, how, how we approach mental health in our profession. And, you know, just looking at that exchange, I'm not, you know, taking Osaka's side, if you want to look at it that way, or the reporter's side from the Cincinnati Inquirer, I know uh, Osaka's agent wound up calling him a bully later, said the bully from the Cincinnati Inquirer and didn't like the tone and didn't like the line of questioning. But larger than that, you know, I found myself thinking after viewing this exchange, she's figuring this, she's figuring this all out in real time. So like she has been very upfront with, oh, I'm not sure I've got the best way of handling press conferences. I don't know. I'm not a press conference expert, but it makes me wonder, are we press conference experts ourselves? I, I go back, I think about my career. I, I, I was in my first press, conf, press conference where I was getting paid. Okay, I'll put it that way. When I was, first, when I was getting paid, I'd say it was like 1990. So it's uh, a long time ago. Nobody really taught me how to do it. Nobody said... This is what we're looking for from you in the press conference setting. This is what, this is what we're looking for from you. And this is your approach. In other words, there was no, uh, Mike, and you know what I'm saying here, and you can tell the people uh, what this means. There was no great mm -hmm. Sawatsky moment oh, for group there. press conferences. Nobody said, hey, this is our organizational mantra. This is our organizational position in a press conference. I have, I'm thankful. Thank God. I'm thankful. I have worked at the Akron Beacon Journal. I've worked at the Cleveland Plain Dealer. Uh, 
I was an intern at the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. I don't know if it's an intern. I had a job, I had a night job. I worked nights answering the phones at the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. Uh, I've worked at the Chicago Tribune. I've worked at the Boston Globe. Uh, I've worked, done some work for ESPN, Fox Sports, NBC. And I, I, I've never, at, at one of those places, had a serious sit down about how we're going to approach mass interviews. So as, as Naomi, and my point Part is, hey, as, as Naomi Osaka, yeah, as she figures out what this means for her, maybe we need to figure out what it means for us too. And she's figuring it out and I give her respect for it. She's thinking about it. She's very candid, transparent about it. Like she doesn't know the right way to do it, but I'm going to say neither do we. And, and maybe uh, there, there are a lot of things to take away from this. One, we need to uh, have, a, have a conference, a summit about how we do business. But two, maybe the whole approach, maybe the whole thing needs to be reconsidered. Uh, is, 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 modern, is modern storytelling, is modern sports writing, is modern sports journalism dead? I mean, is this even the way to do I'm it? So, I, I'm, I'm so pleased to hear you say that. I'm so pleased to hear you say that. Because it's it reminds me of, of, of Billy Hoyle in the backseat of Sydney, or excuse me, driving Sydney Dean in White Man Can't Jump. Michael, you may not be listening, but you're hearing me. Because I distinctly remember telling you when we had this conversation. I remember one of the things I said to you, we had this, this candid passionate conversation back at the French Open, I said, just because it's been done a certain way doesn't mean that that's the right way. Just because we've always done it that way doesn't mean that we can't right. evolve together in this process. That this can't be a learning opportunity for everybody involved. It's like, oh, well, people have, athletes for centuries have had, not centuries, but athletes have always had to stand up there and face the music and why is she so different from anybody else? I'm like, maybe this is a turning point. Maybe this is an inflection point when it comes to athlete media relations. So I am thrilled to hear you say that because that's what I've been saying since this whole conversation started. And thank you for bringing up the name John Sawaski because you know what that man means to me. John Sawaski is the interview scientist. John Sawaski saved my life. Can I take some time and tell a quick story, Mike? Well, not quick. I know I don't do yeah. anything quick. I apologize. But can I take Go some ahead. time to tell, tell a story with John Sawaski? All right, I'll try to be quick, yeah. uh, relatively speaking. I'll yeah. try to be quick. <laughs> okay. Um, I remember I was, uh, so started at the Boston Globe. Um, I was at the Boston Globe from age 21 to 24. Um, and when I got to ESPN at age 24, 25, uh, I got that September of 04, 25, excuse me. I got to ESPN at 25. You couldn't tell me that I didn't know how to interview. Hell, I had, I had spent three plus years observing Michael Holly joined at the hip with Michael Holly. You couldn't tell me I didn't know how to ask the right questions. You couldn't tell me I didn't know what I was doing. Hell, it got me to whatever I was doing. I was doing something right. Got me to the Boston Globe, got me to ESPN at 25. I know what I'm doing. Well, there was this um, highly recommended and eventually mandatory uh, summit that groups of reporters and producers had to attend with John Sawatsky, who was a Canadian journalist turned uh, professor and interview scientist. He's written books on the science, not the art, but the science of interviewing. And I was like, no, nah, I'm good. And I managed to avoid it out of arrogance. Eventually, they made me do it. And it changed my life. It changed my perspective on interviewing. And what I realized is that we don't know what the hell we're doing. Just because we got tape recorders or notebooks or credentials or just because we're journalists by trade, the vast majority of us, people of our ilk, have no idea how to ask questions. Because first and foremost, we believe we got it twisted as to what is a tough question. We think tough sounding questions are tough questions. Half the time, we're not even asking questions to begin with. Half the time, we're just saying, That's right. talk about. 
Half the time we're right. just saying we're 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 we're, we're having we we we're coming in and we're looking for the athlete to confirm what we've already assumed or presumed once we get there. We've already made up mm -hmm. in my mind what the story is, and we already have our opinions, and then we ask these loaded questions. The vast Help me majority fill in. of us. Help me fill in the yes. body of the story that I've already got formulated. Yes. The vast majority of us fail to ask open-ended, lean, and neutral questions. Let me say that again. Open-ended, I would give a little a, a, a on the spot uh, lecture right now. Yep. Open ended, lean open -ended. and neutral questions. All right. All right. Open ended, not yes or no. Okay. But why, how, what, which forces the subject to storytell. It makes them do the work. That's a tough question. The shortest, Mm -hmm. And most neutral and open-ended questions can be the toughest questions because it makes the subject have to be that much more reflective and thoughtful. Okay, makes them do the work versus just yes or no. Okay, and then I'll get to Darty and his mistakes. With all due respect, lean, keep it quick. And admittedly, Michael, we talked about we joked about me not being quick. Or we're not really quick on this show in general. But like I know I know I'm breaking my own rules and Sawatsky's rules when I ask certain questions because it's a conversation versus an interview. And I made the Not determination that right. this is going to be a conversation. And there's a difference. If you want to have a conversation, if you want to be Oprah, then be Oprah and have a conversation. But if you're doing an interview, it is not about output. It's about input. It ain't about you asking the question. It ain't about you sounding smart or thoughtful or informed when you ask the question. It's about the answer. Just like a window ain't about the muck on the window. It's about what's on the other side of that window. The window serves a purpose, but it ain't to cloud what's on the other side of it. And when you when you muck up your question with all kinds of opinions and thoughts and, and, and preconceived notions, you ruin the answer. So if you're doing an interview, do an, inter do an interview. And that leads to the neutrality of the question. Your question can't come with, with, with your opinion on the front end. And then you're asking a question on the back end because now the subject is going to respond to all the stuff that led up to it, which brings me to Darty. All the opinions. When he said, you're not right, crazy. Right. When he says, you're not crazy about doing this with us. So you've established the tone of this off top. And he ended up asking, he ended up eventually asking an open ended neutral question on the back end when he said, how do you balance these two things? And I've heard more difficult questions. Listen, respectfully to the agent, that wasn't that wasn't a bully question. We've heard people ask much more aggressive, not difficult, but much more aggressive questions at press conferences or in right. interviews before. So that that wasn't the worst thing we've ever heard. Okay, so I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't say this is not like oh man he was completely out of line, but his question could have been more effective. That's number one. That's not that's the main that's my main point. And we've heard this quite a few times. If you listen to these questions carefully, I'm like obsessed with this. A lot of times uh, an answer, just because somebody gives an answer doesn't mean it was the best possible answer. Could have been a better answer if you'd asked a better question. And there are so many bad questions that elicit the responses in kind that end up going viral or somebody walks away or somebody gives a flipping right. response to that's like, oh, what well, you did your job. No, not really. Not really, and you don't know what you don't know. So you think you did something right when you really asked a, a, a crappy question, but they responded. So I guess, you know, all's well and ends well to some extent. But the question wasn't horrible. It was, it was the preface to the question that seemed to trigger Naomi Osaka. And I feel for her because I, I, it felt like it was a genuine reaction, and it felt more like she was, again, it's just, from afar, it felt more like Michael. You tell me if, if you picked up on this. It felt more like she was responding to the. Just she was kind of like replaying everything in her head. It was less about what was asked, right. and more about how she struggled to answer the flawed question. She was str clearly struggling to answer it in the way that she felt like she needed to or they wanted to. The moment just got the most of her at that point, uh, for whatever reason. The question, while not the most aggressive, it 
it triggered her because it, it was a, it was a, uh, I wouldn't say it attacked her, but it, the, the, even the premise, the premise rooted in the preface was, well, how do you balance these two things? How do you balance, you know, your brand and, and your, 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 your media empire, your documentary or social following with coming here and subjecting yourself to our flawed questions? Well, that's not the same thing. Like, you shouldn't have to balance those two things. Like, right. one of them is a, is, is, an op, is a traditional obligation. The other one is an athlete, like many are doing, taking control of their own story, their own narrative, and doing things on her terms. One's, one's a choice. The other one is, has, has been traditionally part of the job, which, you know, in closing, brings you back to what you said. I, I've long since said that I, I just, I don't think this should be a requirement. I get why it's a requirement, but I do think there needs to be a larger evaluation as to the value that we're getting out of this and whether it should be required because there are enough people, there are enough people who are comfortable in that setting. There are enough people who, who, who don't mind answering these questions to where somebody is clearly struggling with it. Uh, I think we should approach it with compassion and patience and understanding like you said michael i love how you put it let her figure it out in real time not on our timetable and moving forward not continue to judge her or anybody like her or, or any athlete like her uh that is struggling with this this obligation you know like let's let's it's it, it doesn't always have to be there needs to be some separation and some objectivity when it comes to journalists but it doesn't always have to be combative. It doesn't always have to be adversarial, you know, like everybody eats B. So that, that would be my takeaway from it all right. is that clearly she's still struggling. Clearly she's not right, whether it's got to do with tennis or otherwise. And that's, and as we, as we all fond of saying nowadays, it's okay to not be okay. So if she's, if she's not right. okay. I'm fine with that. And we should not somehow take that as, oh man, you know what? Under whom much is given, much is required, and and these kids so soft nowadays, and and you know, well, uh, what if what if LeBron did something like that? You know, what if Michael Jordan? Michael Jordan could have never got away with pulling out. Michael Jordan had to you know do press conferences. People been having to do press conferences. Well, suck it up. The professional right. athlete. Blah blah blah. It's like it's like so you said, old. man. Like you said, it's like just... I've been saying, maybe we got it wrong. Maybe we got it all wrong. Yeah. And and, and you know what? Or or let's say it this way, Mike. Maybe we got it right at the time. So maybe mm. the way it was done in 1987 was the right time for 1987. It was the right setting. And just like anything else, uh, whether it's your whether it's your car, <laughs> whether it's your your mattress, <laughs> whether it's your house, your kitchen, your kitchen. If you're married, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> at some point, somebody goes into that kitchen and says, this is not going to work anymore. <laughs> Wait a minute! It was fine. It was fine. What do you mean? Wait, you about to get re you about to get a remodeling? Is, is, on, is only pushing you to remodel no, no, no. the kitchen? Is that what you? No, no. Oh, Listen, okay. no. Okay. Whenever we move, I'm just gonna just gonna be straight up. Whenever we move, we move. I just know. You go into the house. Look, hey, nobody goes into a house. Most people don't go into a house and say this kitchen would be great. And usually, I wish I'd be refreshing if that happened. Most of the time, it's oh, we gotta do the kitchen over. Oh, here we go. Uh, but that's yeah. what a lot of people look at it. Look at it that way. It was fine 10 years ago. It was fine five years ago, but just everything has changed. The evolution has happened. It's the evolution of sports, the evolution of society. And so I think that's where we are with not just Naomi Osaka and tennis, but a lot of sports. I mean, you think about it. Uh, in 1995, 1998, the press conference may have been the main vehicle because there was no Instagram, there was no Twitter. Uh, there was no partnership between a lot of networks and sports leagues like there are now. I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm close to home. I'm close. I'm close. So people are some people right now at NBC are saying, oh, what you trying? What, what you saying, preacher? OK, there's a partnership between NBC and the Olympics, right? There's a partnership oh. between NBC and, and, and the National Football League. Same with CBS and ABC slash ESPN and Fox. Because of that, interviewing and access has taken on 
a different look, a different feel than it did 20 years ago. That's just a fact. And so league insiders in the era of Will McDonough in the late 1980s are different than league insiders in 2021. So you got to adjust to that. And that's, that leads to a different type of relationship between athlete and insider, athlete and media. And, and you already brought up the point of certain athletes controlling their own story. So uh, here, let, let me make it plain. Some athletes are saying, what's in it for me? They never had to say that. Maybe they didn't say that 30 years ago. It was obvious. What's in it for you? This is your, this is your main media vehicle. This is your main communication vehicle. And they look at it now and say, well, no, this is not my main vehicle. This is a nuisance. So if you can explain what's in it for me, I might do it. Otherwise, what's the point? So maybe we well, all just have to sponsor, come back to the sponsors table. Sponsors would like a word with us. Sponsors would like a word with yes. us. The tour would like a word with us. There, there is, I, I, I do understand, and as you mentioned, the networks. The networks, the sponsors, the tour. Right. Like, there is a larger machine that requires Naomi Osaka yes. and others to feed that machine. I, I understand. I understand that. I, I get it. All I'm saying is, is I'm I'm okay with you, you know, uh, there's been some unfortunate analogies used over the years about inmates running prisons and whatnot. But you, you remember like, mm. and it goes back to elementary school. You know, if if uh, well if, if you don't do it, then that, then then the next person's not going to have to do it. Like if we, if we let yeah, you yeah, off yeah, the yeah. hook, then we got to let everybody off the hook. It's like well, no, not necessarily, not necessarily. You know, I think we can. I think we're all we all should be mature enough to say, you know what? This doesn't work for her. It does work for the vast majority of her her colleagues, contemporaries and her peers. This doesn't have to be as difficult as we make it out to be. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. And we, right. didn't, and we didn't and we didn't show the rest. You know, we, we, we showed the, the part that grabbed the headlines with her breaking down and leaving. But she as you pointed out, Michael, she did come back and she did finish the she interview back. and she did answer the questions. She did answer the questions. So it's not like she just tapped out. But um, I, I, I love your I love how you started this. Um, you know, and I, I won't ramble anymore. Uh, thanks for letting me nerd out because I because when, when I really want to nerd out on on interviewing because I'm like, we, we, yeah, I'm glad you did over. Terrible question. I'm but glad you did. I like I mean, how you started it, which is which is as Naomi figures out how she's going to move forward in real time. You, let's make sure we take this and op, take this opportunity to evaluate how we're doing it. In real there's time. a lot to and maybe more yeah. people need to hey, look it up. John Sawatsky, S A W A T, uh, it's great. S K Y. John Sawatsky, like he will he will change your life. He changed mine. Uh, matter of fact, he will change how you argue. Because let me tell you something. He'll change how you argue, and he'll change. He'll you get change into it with the way you get other. Yeah. You get into it with your significant other. It could be pretty handy how he teaches you to ask questions. I'm telling you. Yep, and he'll he'll change how you uh, view those questions too. How you view other people asking questions. And it's the last thing I said when I said, uh, you know, is sports journalism dead? I hope not. Uh, but I think it's becoming more and more rare. Like the so-called purity of sports journalism. It's it's hard to find purity in it because it's just so many. There's so many things to consider. Okay, um, let's say when uh, if you're covering a beat in uh, the the 1990 early 1990s, maybe you don't have to consider. Hey, uh, I'm a reporter uh, somewhere in the middle of the country, and I can get a scoop by outworking the other guy. Well. That sounds nice, <laughs> right? That sounds good. But that's not really how it works now. You know, a lot of scoops come from the top. Uh, you have agents who say, hey, Joel Embiid is going to have, it's going to sign uh, the Supermax. Am I going to give that to somebody in Philadelphia? I don't even know who broke the story. I'm just using that example, Mike. Um, am I, am I going to give that to somebody in Philadelphia? At the Philadelphia Inquirer, or do I, am I gonna? Uh, uh, is that another Woj bomb? Well, I give it to Woj. Um, 
Marcus Smart, $77 million extension with the Celtics. I don't know if that was that. Did that come from the Boston Globe or the Athletic? I doubt it. So it's just, it's different now. And, and we all have to just look at where we are and how do we manage in this new ecosystem that for, for some of us, uh, for some of those who are under 30, it's not new, it's just what you know. Those of us who are over 30, other side of 30, it takes some adjustment. So the athletes are adjusting, we're adjusting too. We just got to figure out the best way to do it. Um, probably best time to take a break. And it's funny, this topic yep. dovetails into um, some athlete generated content we want to preview. And you just touched on a couple other stories that uh, maybe we get into on the other side, which was uh, Embiid and Marcus Smart uh, both getting the bag. Um, so yeah, but no, um, I hope that was a productive conversation. I always wonder if if viewers care uh, about our perspective on our job, like how the sausage, curtain, but like how the sausage is, how the how sausage, the sausage is, made. is made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. But I'm telling you, man, exactly. like, you just want to eat the sausage. I don't want I don't want the details. Just want to eat the links, eat, right? <laughs> even the people, even the people who are famous for interviewing, are actually not good at it. True story. Like if you understand the science and you, and you notice the flaws, you'd be like, damn. This person like gets people, famous people, and like is a, you know, millionaire, a million times over. But that was really a crappy question. But again, are you in conversation, or are you doing an interview? And if you an interview, that's the distinction. You are right not there. the story. That's the distinction. You are not the story. Right. Hey, thanks for watching, brother from another on YouTube. Make sure you hit subscribe before you leave, and be sure to watch us three to five p.m. Eastern time on Peacock. Appreciate you.